we've seen a big upturn in in how we want to outsource, I think, as well. As the companies have gone through that, they've realized that that outsourcing dirty word is actually it's a great partnership because now I've got the ability to work with a partner and create skill and talent that possibly I can't find myself. And we've seen that definitely the whole, you know, the great resignation thing we talk about here in tech is certainly in Rwanda, we have the great application. You give me a, you tell me you want that, I can find the skill and I can create it here and deliver it to you. And with the pandemic, if you're working offsite, it doesn't matter if offsite is the house next door or the house in Kigali, you're offsite. You're not with somebody. So your team can be remote anywhere in the world. And having a remote team sat in Kigali, as long as they're doing the job, makes no difference if they're two, two doors down in the house next door to you. Right. So that ability to see or not be so nervous or constrained about a remote team not being able to absorb a client's culture or the ability to deliver, we've shown we can do it. You know, All the sites are doing it. And we, we deliver, not just tech, all the outsourcers delivering delivering at scale for technology or for um, for the entry level services is part of what's important and it makes a difference. Welcome to Melia Cred Conversations with Elvis. I'm Elvis Melia and at Melia Cred we provide consultancy and research for economic development. And in these conversations, I seek to understand what the internet is doing to global labor markets, whether or not it's allowing workers from the global south to earn a better living than they could in the past by exporting services to clients in the global north, around the world, and honing skills and developing careers developing pathways that maybe hitherto didn't even exist, or if they did exist, were closed off to people who were far away from the global centers of productivity. In the current cluster of conversations, I am speaking with various ecosystem players in Kigali, Rwanda, for establishing and growing a global business services industry in Kigali. And so far I've spoken with training providers and other ecosystem players. I spoke with Adewale Yusuf of Alt School Africa. I spoke with Joseph Samafara of Solvit Africa. I spoke with Orien Ruzibiza of Education First. We spoke with Pepita Uineza of Pesa Choice. We had an interlude with uh, Hassan the Creator looking over at what's happening in the uh, creative industries across the continent, and particularly in Nigeria. Then I spoke with Vivens Obwezimana of Umurava. With all those ecosystem players facilitating a, a soft landing, as Joseph called it, for global business services companies, the most interesting part, of course, is what these companies themselves think. So today's conversation, finally, is with Gary Bennett, the country manager of Tech Experts. Gary, as you'll hear, is extremely experienced and extremely funny. I enjoyed the conversation very much with Gary, and I hope you do too. Here is Gary Bennett. Gary. Hi. Thanks for doing this. Pleasure. When did we first meet? We first met beginning of this year um, when we started to do the work around the analysts for the GBS sector and also the work with GIZ and the study you were doing on the future of work. Wasn't it November? Like so oh, yeah. last, so when so time flies. You right, see. we had the first workshop. Oh, was that in November? Wasn't right, it? right, where okay. we had you know the, the, the people calling in mm. and you were there with Hannah from Harambe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, so that's our first yeah, kind of yeah. our dress rehearsal. In that hotel and the overlook the, yeah, 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 yeah. right. Uh, and, uh, and then we did the second one in March. Yeah, the right? proper so one, yeah. Where we brought in the yeah. analysts. No, they were really good, good sessions. That was a year ago, feeling yeah. old now, yeah. feeling old. Right. <sighs> what do you do? Um, I'm the country manager for Tech Experts. So I'm responsible for the operation that runs here for our global clients, for all the business support services and making sure that we've growing talent and we've got a good talent pipeline for you know for making the country a success okay okay and what, what does tech experts what's your business we do tech support so it's um i guess it's the case handling more higher end side of tech support so it's not like help desk hello my pc's broken it's more of the software support side of things everything from cloud services 
um, through to stuff that you and I would use from a cloud perspective, and that's for enterprises um, and consumers alike, but global clients. Okay, okay, so you're exporting higher-end services from Rwanda to your clients in the world. So Tech Experts has offices in how many locations? So we've got offices in around 14 different locations. We've got Tech expert sites in around seven of those, and that's completely global. So it's everything from Colorado in the US, Sofia in Bulgaria, our largest site, which is in Nigeria, then right over to the eastern side of the world, we've got a site in Vietnam and a site in China. Um, and then for nearshore stuff from the Americas, we've got a Costa Rica site as well. Okay. So truly global, so we've got the ability to follow the sun with our cases. But what's slightly unique about Rwanda is we're 24-7. So we've got teams that work in the Rwanda site that are aligned to all the different time zones. Because um, it's safe here, I can move people around with our transport through the night. Um, so we've got the ability to move the talent around where we need it. So you said your largest site is in Nigeria? Yeah. How many people do you have there? 1,800. 1,800. How many people do you have globally? About 6,000. 6,000, yeah. 1,800 in Nigeria. Yeah. And now here? Um, here we've been live for a year, so we started with 53, and we're now at about 200. Okay, okay. And so that's interesting. So you have that comparison between Nigeria, which has all the people, yeah. and Rwanda, which has all the governance. Yeah. Right? So, yeah, so yeah. How, how is that for you, to, this comparison? Did, did, it works really well, and that's what we try and do with our sites, is each site will probably offer something slightly different. Um, so yeah, you're 100% right. I mean, Nigeria, 225 million people, they've got all that scale, but making sure you do business in a, in a global way is, is just a bit trickier, um, you know, just from the point of view of business, um, business uh, BCP, from the point of view of making sure that you've got continuity of service. Whereas here, we've got less people, 13 million, about 1.2 million people in Kigali, and but we've got all the secure power, connectivity. Like I said, I can move people around. It's safe, it's secure. Um, doing business is really, really easy here. And then we will scale this to the size that we think is probably about right for Rwanda. So probably be about 800,000 people um, to, to be able to support that and be able to supply the services. So yeah, it's, each site has something slightly different. So our Bulgaria site has good access to a variety of languages. Obviously, from a, a China and Vietnam side of things, being able to support those languages and those skills on the eastern side of the world is, is good. But doing business in China is obviously very different to doing business in, in uh, Costa Rica or in America. So you personally, you've been in this space for a bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. I look young, obviously. But um, yeah, I've, I've done this for a while. So I originally worked in the UK. I worked for Virgin in the UK. And then I went to set up our offshore operation in South Africa. Um, that was about 17, 18 years ago, and I stayed. So I did the other way around. Instead of running the operation from, um, from the UK into South Africa, I stayed in South Africa and worked across the two operations, and then ultimately became native and started to work for global providers in, in South Africa and working with growing the industry in South Africa. And this is all global business services, BPO, yeah. business yeah, yeah. process outsourcing. So originally, yeah, originally it was more, I guess, broad-based outsourcing. So the stuff that you and I would, when you phone your telco company or when you phone your mobile provider. Um, so it's that kind of thing. And we would run it for UK companies or US companies out of South Africa. And then obviously tech is slightly different. Tech is slightly further up the food chain, for want of a better expression. This is more case handling, very defined skills, and people with very particular degrees to be able to do the work. So you experienced in South Africa what we hope to experience in other sub-Saharan African countries. In the, you, know, you experienced that in the past 10, 15 mm. years, 17 years. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what South Africa really started out with what? First Amazon came in and did a captive, and then two other BPOs came in and kind of like, and then just the oh. cluster kind of grew there. Yeah, further back than that probably, and the original stuff was AOL was in, was in South Africa a long time ago. Okay. Um, and then the UK started to, to pick up on South Africa more and more. So some of the big ISPs out of the UK to people like Talk Talk, um, some of the retail companies had presence in South Africa. So the initial affinity was to the UK. Um, so time zone wise, culturally wise, you know, there was an, it was easy for a South African to speak to somebody like me in the UK and, and relate and provide services. And then you started to see Virgin and some of the utility companies doing it. So that was kind of the start. Um, but yeah, what you say is what I see in Rwanda and, and as you start to see more of these countries, sub-Sahara, it is where it, South Africa was a few years ago. So it's got all the building blocks. You've got the, the right governance, you've got the right talent, 
it makes a difference. So it has that true impact sourcing angle to it. It makes a difference to that person getting a job, earning an income, learning skills. And that's the bit that I guess has the power. But yeah, very much, very much like South Africa. We just need to learn from countries like South Africa to make sure that it doesn't take 15 years this time. It, does, it happens a lot quicker. So, so South Africa is mostly Cape Town or like how much Durban, how much Johannesburg is, is Cape Town is where it's still at when you're exporting, right? Or Not l less so now, very much less so. I mean, Cape Town was the, the big showpiece, but ironically, when we went with Virgin, we set up in Joburg. Mm -hmm. So you hear less about Joburg and Joburg has a lot more um, I guess, uh, adverse press than it does at Cape Town. Cape Town has the mountain, it's beautiful, it's vineyards, and definitely a strong affinity to the UK. You know, good, good marketing from that, the part of the industry body from Cape Town. So yeah, really strong. So that's the, the original center of it. But Durban now has a real big um, UK and even probably, probably even bigger US links from Durban. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot mm -hmm. of lot of um, telcos out of the US into Durban. Um, so a lot of companies really set up there now and exporting those global services. So that's Durban is really CCI, like kind of pushing that also, right? Because um, they're also here, right? Originally, but now WebHelp are in, in Durbs. Um, and a lot of the companies have seen, you know, because Cape Town, although Cape Town is that vanguard, it's also in terms of size of city, relatively small. So it's about three, four million people maybe, whereas Joburg's like seven, eight million people, and Durban you've got another three million people you can go at. And then Durban is, is a smaller ecosystem, so moving people around and transport's a bit easier in Durban. And from an accent point of view, uh, Durban's the biggest Indian community outside of India. So accent is slightly different, um, and the ability to provide different services out of there is, is good. So you're seeing the companies that are in Cape Town opening up in um, Derbs because it provides a good BCP, but also it allows them to provide different levels of service. So yeah, it's it's kind of grown organically quite nicely. Right. Okay. Okay. And you mentioned before that uh, you you came to Rwanda doing with tech experts slightly higher end mm -hmm. services. Yeah. From a layman's perspective, it would seem kind of counterintuitive. If you're going to a new location, and I want to talk about mm. you guys were the first here yeah. exporting services from here and, and scaling that. Mm. Um, coming to a new location, wouldn't you? Wouldn't it be make more sense to start like at the bottom of the food chain in, because you need to grow the talent and have the talent grow with you? How how do you bridge that gap? Like how could you uh, jump in at a higher yeah. level on the rung on the ladder kind yeah. of? Thing? Some of it is very intentional. So when we come to a location like this, it, it gives us two things. One, as an early adopter, you can go out and choose and create your world and create your ecosystem. And it's intentional because we come with a whole barrage of abilities to train and develop people. So some of the stuff you see in this room is all about Elevate. Elevate is our sister company that does digital skilling. So when we go to a location, we do a lot of work obviously around the due diligence and you know can it support the infrastructure pieces and then the key is the talent we're all about people you know tech doesn't make anything or no outsourcer makes anything the only difference between me and another outsourcer or another provider is that person sat in that seat and how good they are um, that's the that's the differentiator so when we started to look at the talent that was here um, yes, there's a need to develop it. We know that. So we work with um, Rwanda Development Board to say, right, how do we start to bridge some of that and create that pipeline? And that was the same in South Africa. Years ago when I was there, creating skill was the big question mark. How do you create it? How do you, you know, Philippines is the obvious model where they've got a million people now working in, in GBS and BPO, and they've got that engine of creating talent. So how do you come in here, Rwanda, on a smaller scale, but as you said, at a higher end? So... I think the comparison would be if you go into a call center in, um, in South Africa, you won't find many kids with degrees. Um, it'll be the matrics, the secondary school educated guys who have got all the smarts and can do it but haven't got either the wherewithal or the opportunity to go into university. So this is good employment. You can come in, you can join, you can start as an agent or an engineer in our terminology, and then you can grow into different roles, a coach, a team leader, um, a subject matter expert. You can move into HR or training. So you've got that ability to grow your career. Um, so when we come into a place like here, what we're looking for is we're looking for people with a good degree. So IT degrees, STEM degrees. So what country has got a good supply of people with degrees? Um, and the Rwanda education system has that. So we have about, I think, I think the number is about 44,000 graduates a year and about a quarter of those have got some kind of IT or STEM degree. So we've already got a good feeder of people who think in ones and zeros. And then what we need to do, like you said, is turn those ones and zeros into 
the theory of that and how do I help Elvis when Elvis has a problem with his cloud services. So it's a very conscious and intentional decision to come somewhere where we don't have lots of competition, lots of people go and will come and work for us because we do something similar. We can create the talent and then once people are in working with us, we make sure the environment is sticky and we grow people's careers so they want to stay with us. So actually it's, it's easier. And then what you talked about is the further down, and I'm going to say food chain, but it's not literally. So the different types of outsourcing. Less will, complex. Yeah, less complex. Maybe, yeah, yeah. Will, will support us in the future because you're right. The kids that join us now, we spend a lot of time focusing on communication skills, customer skills, all those kind of things that you universities, traditional universities don't teach. So we work on honing that and then giving them some of the technical talents. So as the industry grows here in Rwanda, which I'm sure it will, then you will have had people who will come through some of the less complex work and they're very used to talking, typing, thinking and all that kind of thing. So as you, as you would do in a customer service environment, and then we will layer the technology on top of that. So I think in right. the future what we'll see is Whereas now we really focus on the IT degree and build the customer service skills. In the future, I'll be able to take a tech savvy customer service person and then give them the technology, so give them the IT skills and bring them in in the future. So it, if it works well, it all works to, to grow the industry, not in any way be competitive. Um, so those less complex things, you're right, will grow a much stronger ecosystem going forward and people will have that ability to work their career up from a different point. Right, okay, okay. So one of the things that's interesting for us from like a, you know, studying the sector mm. and studying development globally, in the past we've had the manufacturing sector kind of lifting countries out mm. of poverty, you know, in East Asia. Yeah. And, and, uh, and what that was a lot of times was light manufacturing. And in light manufacturing was a lot of times garments, apparel manufacturing, which mm. was essentially rows and rows of mainly women mm -hmm. uh, sewing t-shirts, sewing pants, yeah. right? Uh, and what came out of that was twofold. You've got a, a, you know, rural urban migration, people moving to mm. cities, absorbing those people, and having many of those people be women in that apparel manufacturing sector um, had many benefits in terms of family planning and in mm. terms of uh, uh, gender equity, and, and, and that kind of really helped also make countries like more sustainably, yeah. in a sense of more economic, the economic growth in those countries was 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 a genuine economic mm. growth rather than you know some other countries who, who whose gdp per capita grows on paper due to say oil mm. right that's really a sector what we call a, a productive sector and it's mm. exporting so you're competing on global markets yeah. now why am i talking about manufacturing is there a parallel maybe also in terms of the gender roles and in terms of the the uh, the call center contact center bpo industry what is the uh, gender ratio in, the, in, in this sector? And do you see a parallel to this, you know, absorbing people coming in from, from the moving to the cities? Yeah, I think, I think there's definitely a place for both. I think the difference there, if I picture your, your rows of people doing sewing, they're always going to be doing sewing. Okay, they may become a leader of 10 people doing sewing. But I think the difference with um, a GBS or a BPO thing, like I said, is you can come in and end up doing something different. You don't have to. You can be an engineer and be really good at it and do that for all your life, not a problem. If that's what you want to do and that works for you because you, you're earning and you're supporting your family, whoever you need to support, then that's great. But if you do want to grow a career and do something different and then you know, maybe after three, four years with us, you want to go into software engineering or open your own business, then that's great. That's part of what it's about. And I think that's the, the difference. You're right, that manufacturing uplifting is a core, it's a cornerstone of, of supporting a country and a big drive for Rwanda. Um, I think what the GBS stuff does, it, it allows you to have that, that export side of it, but it also creates potential careers for people so their lives can be slightly different. Right. Um, definite focus on gender balance. So we run programs um, with our partners. So Microsoft, for instance, we've just finished a Microsoft Leap program. And that looks at bringing non-traditional skills, as they call them, but ladies into technology. So we try and make sure we, we move, we're getting towards a more of a 50-50 balance of ladies in technology. Here, we're probably around, what are we around, maybe 35 percent ladies, 65 percent men. Needs a big focus, definitely when we go out with a job ad bulk of it is, is gentlemen applying rather than ladies. But again, back to want to be very intentional. So we are, our DEI policy is very much about how do we make sure the environment is inclusive and you get all the benefits of having a variety of people. Because it's not just ladies, it's also how do we find the partners out there that bring people with disabilities in? 
because that is eminently doable here, whereas a, a person with disabilities may not be able to work a sewing machine, they can work this because this is IT equipment. And I can give you support stuff, a different mouse, a different monitor, whatever it takes, I can get you in and I can get you working here. So how does the industry that we're working in GBS allow us to broaden and make that more inclusive? You know, it can also be people, it can be refugees, it can be anyone, because it's about giving you a skill and you being able to deliver that skill. So actually as a refugee, and we've got some cases here where people have come in from the, the wider East Africa network and we need maybe German skills or we need, you know, kind of Portuguese skills and they may have come in as a refugee from, um, from Mozambique or from one of the other countries and we can use that language skill, which is unique to them, and give them the IT skills. So I think it, it supports manufacturing, it's a different view of it, and a definite drive to be inclusive. There's a need, it has to be a diverse environment. It can't be just a load of guys in pretend lab coats sitting in a room. It has to be a diverse environment, diverse skills, and providing differentiated services to people. Because we don't just do case handling tech support, we also run um, customer success, which is all about relationship building with existing customers. So you use that product, do you know if you had that product with that product, that really makes your day even easier. Okay, and then it's another subscription service. So it's a, a relationship building service and we do some sales support. So we have to have that diversity of skill and ability, not just gentlemen who've got a degree in IT. And some of that is also supporting very much the Rwanda mandate. Rwanda's got the highest number of females in parliament, for instance, in the world. So there's a definite drive in country to make sure that all of what we do supports that that gender balance, if you use gender as the you know, yeah. kind of proxy for it. Yeah, so, so that goes very much into impact sourcing, right? Yeah, yeah. So if you're creating, I mean, in a, in a country like Rwanda, just creating this kind of job mm. at this kind of salary level that in itself is impact, right? You don't yeah. have to do anything in a community or something. You mm. just give them the paycheck yeah. and that's the impact, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? So, so how do you, and so you've been in this industry for 17 years now. How do you see the industry having changed and also the perception of the industry having changed? Because we have a bit of, once in a while you get literature coming out of India saying, you know, this, there's this derogatory term of a, of a digital sweatshop, mm -hmm. right? Like this, you know, people working uh, uh, long hours, uh, no benefits, mm. uh, you know, all, all that, like these, the, the, the labor rights mm. and, 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 and that the, this industry has, uh, you know, I mean, the same criticism goes for the manufacturing sector, yeah, yeah. But, but so, um, and it's good that people look out for that, for, look in on, on, on that, but mm, that, that there's also not, re there's a perception in parts of the literature mm. that there's not really room for upward mobility for workers. So for example, and what they're thinking of is maybe call center, taking mm. calls for a telco. Mm. You're doing that for two years after you graduate. You're, you're, there's a ceiling in terms of how far you can move because there's only so many floor managers, right? Yeah, there's yeah, no, yeah. There's a, yeah, yeah. And there's a ceiling in terms of how much you can make there. Mm -hmm. So the question in the literature out there is there is that is that shouldn't people be trying to focus on their career earlier instead of doing that for two years? Um, and how does that fit with your experience of the sector and also the way the sector has changed over the last 17 years? I think you're not wrong that that, that you know, that, that digital sweatshop, that idea that it's, you know, kind of you get in and it's a dead end and, you know, kind of where am I going to go, what am I going to do? I think some of it is definitely that impact angle. So if you, if you relate it to call centers in the UK, you know, kind of my home, absolutely, it's beer money for people. They do it while they study. It's probably not viewed as a career. I think that's changing as well and then you flip it into a context in, in Rwanda or in South Africa, if you've got 34% unemployment and somebody's very graciously going, why don't you focus on your career? You need to focus on the food on my table to feed myself before I can have my career. So somebody's going to give me a job and money, and it's not going to be forever. Don't get me, I don't sit here. If, you, if you're an agent in a call center and that's not your choice to do that forever, absolutely focus on something else. But what it does is it gives you the opportunity. You're out in the workplace. Most of what we saw in South Africa was the guys have got all the ability to do the job. There's no one's connecting the dots to get them in front of the right people to do the interview, to get the job, to go on to the next thing. So I don't kid myself for one minute that's in, in my call center life before I was at tech. Everyone was saying, right, what, what next? Where next? Because you probably don't want to do that forever. You can move between a telco and go and do some financial services. You can change product, if you like, but it's essentially the same thing. And you're growing your skills around how you handle customers, so you've got that ability to earn more through bonuses and those kind of things. But yeah, you're right, it's, it's not necessarily something everyone wants to do for life. 
So what do they do next? Is it an entrepreneur thing? Is it an SME? But what it allows you to do, it allows you to do that in parallel. You know, we don't, I've seen some press around, you know, Indian companies not being happy that people have a side hustle. We don't have a problem with that. You know, as long as it impact the job that you do here and it's not competitive necessarily, you working out where you go next, we want to support that. The longer you stay with us and you're happy and you're, you're productive, then that's benefit to us. But I don't for one minute think you're going to stay with me forever. Um, in fact, I don't want you to. There's a point where if you've been doing as, a, as an agent for two, two and a half years, you're going to be struggle to be cheerful and happy answering the same thing for two and a half. So we, there's an onus on the provider, I think, to provide what's that next thing for you. Is it a coach? Is it a team leader? Do you need to move campaigns and go and look at something different to re-energize you? So in any industry, there's going to be people to have, with bad practice. you know. But whether I've just been blessed or lucky enough to work for companies that that don't do that, because to me, it's counterintuitive. Like we said earlier, the only thing that makes tech or any provider different is that person. So if you're not, and it's the old service profit chain stuff, if you're not making that person happy and fulfilled, when that person speaks to Elvis to solve his problem, Elvis is gonna hear that he's not happy and fulfilled. You know, you cannot fake it really. So I want you to be happy to be here and enthusiastic and Elvis, yeah, I can take your problem, I'm gonna solve that for you. And if that works, then Elvis is happy and then the ultimate client is happy and it's a, it's a happy ecosystem. So creating an environment where people don't want to do that, slightly different in manufacturing, because if I'm banging out trainers, I can sew and I can do my trainers happy, sad, doesn't make a lot of difference, but in our business, the way you are and the personality you have and what you exude on a call is part of what makes you successful. And that's got to be in an environment that has benefits, is in a good place to sit, has got things to do in your break time and that kind of thing. So creating a sweatshop for me is counterintuitive. And yeah, okay, it might, it might work for a little bit because people want the money and they want the job, but it isn't going to be successful. Right. Um, and certainly in a global market because ultimately the clients will choose, there's a procurement process, they're going to want to visit, to visit you. So for this site, we had to get client sign off. They need to come and visit, see it, make sure it's secure, make sure it's PCI compliant, make sure it's got all the right bells and whistles and that the people aren't in a bad place when they work here. Because people fundamentally are good and don't want to put somebody else in a bad situation. It isn't about you haven't got anywhere to go, let's just give you a job and you can sit in a shed and do it. It's about giving you the right environment and right place to make you as successful as you can be. Because if you're successful, then the client's going to be happy, the customers are going to be happy, and it's going to be a good place to work. Right. How do you feel about trajectories, career trajectories? And it, um, we did this study mm. on uh, a local BPO here serving the local telcos, mm. right? And um, we asked current workers and we asked past workers, former workers, mm. right? How, because the current workers can't really tell you where their careers are going, right? And the former workers, I mean, it's not a huge sample mm -hmm. that we had, but the former workers, pretty to a person, told us that they actually treasured their work at that BPO mm -hmm. because at the time, yeah, the pay was okay, but uh, you know, compared to their peers, they were making okay money. And but what they did take away from it was the communication skills. Wherever they went afterwards, mm. they felt that okay, I can you know I can help somebody solve their problem, yeah. right? And I can use my voice doing that. And sometimes, and it's trial and error, right? Mm. Sometimes you get off the phone and, the, and you think, oh, that person's going to leave a bad review, mm. right? And sometimes you get off the phone and you feel really good, like yeah. oh yeah. And it, that's kind of a, a, a working progress. And after doing that for two years, you're going to have that under your belt, mm. right? Did you, did you feel that like wh where do people go after they work? And, and I'm more talking about the lower entry barrier support than maybe what tech experts does because yeah. it's already there are already people who have some tech knowledge right? mm. um, it's a life skill isn't it it's it's what we see when we interview graduates from different universities and the university has a focus on creating an employable person as opposed to just giving a piece of paper and says you're really good at it if you're going to be a rocket scientist it doesn't matter so much whether you communicate you need to know about nitrogen and oxygen and how rockets work because you're going to sit in a room with your lab coat on whereas if you want to come into something like this and you've got to be able to sell yourself so that's an interview and that's at everything you do and those communication skills are key it doesn't matter what you go and do next like if you've like you said if you've you've sat and you've done that for a local telco when you walk into an interview with us i can tell you know, I can tell that you've got that experience. I'm confident to sit in front of Elvis because I've chatted to people all over the world or all over Rwanda and I can sit and go, I can have that conversation with you and look you in the eye and be confident about what I'm doing because it's a communication skill. I'm, 
I'm no rocket scientist by any stretch of the imagination. I don't even have a degree. I hope that doesn't affect my job, and I didn't say that on my application. Um, but and I don't. I don't have degrees, but I think the thing that I've been able to do over the years, and I guess working in industries that are service-related, is relate to people. Like you said, that ability to relate to people gets you through a lot of situations. And you will get some wrong, absolutely. You're not going to hit it off with everybody. But if you've got that core ability to relate, then you can find a common ground and make a plan. And that's, like I said, that's very different to a manufacturing where you go and do a similar thing every day, maybe not communicate, but you're very good at that skill. But here, it is about communicating with you. You're in a team of people, so you have to work as a team to deliver everything that you're doing. And you have to communicate to people externally. So it does, it grows. It, it's almost like joining the army, isn't it? You can join the army and go and do lots of things. You don't just go out and kill people. You can be in communications. You can fly things. You can be in the engineering corps. You can do so many different things. Call centers are a bit like that. You come in and you start and we train you to do this. So you come as an infantry person and then go, right, what do I want to do? Do I want to specialize in a particular thing? Do I want to become a coach? Do I want to become you know, a trainer? So although, like you said, those jobs, there aren't the same volume, so it's a bit of a pyramid, they're there and you can work between them and move between them. And every time we grow, so the success we've had with tech here in Rwanda, we started with 53 people and there's no salesman going out there knocking on doors saying, give us more work. The client gave us more work because they were successful. So as we grow and we say, right, we now want another 53, that means another, it's a ratio business, that means another group of team leaders, that needs another group of coaches, another group of team leaders. So as we grow, our aim is always to take from internally. So it might not be growing into a different role, but it might be growing into a level two engineer because now we move you up and we'll bring in a new person at the bottom. So there's always that desire and drive to create new talent and opportunity. And back to that comes from you performing. If we perform, people are going to give us more work. I don't have to sell it to you. They go, wow, it's really great. Great experience. Customers love it. Love talking to the guys in Rwanda. Let's give you more. Right. So, so let's about growing, about the industry. About 2014, 2015, 2016, we had a bunch of books. You'd go to the airport and you'd pick up a book and it would say, the future of work, no work, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the robots are coming to take mm -hmm. the work. And especially they would say call centers, you know, yeah. contact centers. You know, bots are going to take all the work away. And I think a lot of companies invested in technology mm. and it didn't go that well. <laughs> uh, in terms we all of love that bot experience. <laughs> no, that's not what I asked. <laughs> it's like when speech recognition came out. Say no now. No! <laughs> and then it hangs up on you. It's kind of like, yeah. <laughs> right, right. So, so the, the, what happened during the pandemic, even before, but like this sector, okay, the way I saw from the outside, mm. the way I saw the sector was like in the beginning of the pandemic, the sector kind of went down a bit because of, you know, for example, travel or mm. like uh, your, if your clients aren't having any business, you're not going to have any business. And because of lockdowns in delivery locations, mm. right? But throughout the pandemic, it really seemed like, like for example, a company like Majorel, I mean, in terms of, in terms of the FTE numbers from 2019 to now, this sector is really, I mean, it's really expanding. Yeah, it is a, it's a bizarre collateral benefit from a sector perspective of what we all went through. I mean, when we went through it, it was a massive learning exercise for all of us. You know, we were all pretty much, especially for the bigger centers, bricks and mortar, everyone comes in, big hubs. You know, Nigeria is where we've got 1,800 people. It's one hub, it's one building. Um, all of a sudden, that building isn't able to open. You've got to create an immense amount of work from home, work from hotels, work from wherever, laptops, connectivity, all those kind of things. And we went through an immense amount of learning really quickly. And I was in Durban at the time, and it was, it was like a house of cards. So we were, providing, we were part of a network providing support for a, a US airline. And we could see their contact centers closing as each city locked down. So they'd lose India, they'd lose the Philippines, we'd ramp up because we had to have more people because we were now taking all the volume. And then inevitability, we had to shut down. So then all of a sudden the airline was like, we've now got no one. We well, the good thing with an airline is they also had to shut down. Yeah, <laughs> and they did, all, but, but they also had, beforehand, they had to do all the refunds and process all the, so they became right. incredibly oh, yes, busy. Yes, it right. became incredibly busy because everyone's going, I need to change this, I need to cancel that, and here's my refund, where's this? And of course, none of the, none of the automated systems, your bots, could deal with that because it yeah. wasn't built, it wasn't configured, there was no AI that sat behind it. So you had to have a person to go, right, you were flying to Miami, Miami's now locked down, well, I can fly you into Tampa and you can get a car. So we had to do all of that manually. I never thought of that, yeah. even though the planes are grounded, especially because the yeah. planes are grounded, People, the contact centers are going yeah. up, right? Yeah. What do you course. do? You phone somebody because the website can't deal with it because it's out of process. So it had to be a human touch. And I think that was one of those differences is, yes, for sure, there are bots that can take over a, 
a chunk of the more transactional stuff, or you can use chat and you've got different, you know, different channels to come into somebody. But ultimately, it's just more contact points. And so ultimately, we've all been there. At some point, you want to talk to somebody. All this technology is great, but it has to be supported by a person. Um, because ultimately, I just want to talk to you. I want you to fix it because I can't answer another question about this. And you know, self-serve is great when it works. When it doesn't work, it's just really frustrating. So post-pandemic, you're right. It has seen growth. And growth is also around diversity because I think the realization was Putting 1,800 people in one city was great at the time from a cost perspective, a procurement perspective, a client flies into one site, sees everyone perspective. When it shuts, it's a nightmare because you've got to find homes for all those people and make it work. Whereas possibly smaller loads, more diversity, um, that ability to spread your load, because the technology can do it, spread your load around the world makes it a slightly better option, even between centers within countries. So hence that Durban Cape Town thing, let's have a bit of a difference because if Cape Town's got an issue, I can route everything to Durban. So so yeah, it has, we've seen a big upturn in in how we want to outsource, I think as well, as the companies have gone through that, they've realized that that outsourcing dirty word is actually, it's a great partnership because now I've got the ability to work with a partner and create skill and talent that possibly I can't find myself. And we've seen that definitely the whole, you know, the great resignation thing we talk about here in tech is certainly in Rwanda, we have the great application. You give me a, you tell me you want that, I can find the skill and I can create it here and deliver it to you. And with the pandemic, if you're working offsite, it doesn't matter if offsite is the house next door or the house in Kigali, you're offsite, you're not with somebody. So your team can be remote anywhere in the world and having a remote team sat in Kigali, as long as they're doing the job, makes no difference if they're two, two doors down in the house next door to you. Right. So that ability to see or not be so nervous or constrained about a remote team not being able to absorb a client's culture or the ability to deliver, we've shown we can do it. You know, All the sites are doing it and we, we deliver, not just tech, all the outsourcers delivering delivering at scale for technology or for, um, for the entry level services is part of what's important and it makes right. a difference. Right, right. I want to give a shout out to KLM. They're mm -hmm. not sponsoring anything. But Are they not? Okay. During, yes, they'd like the, to though. They, <laughs> <laughs> during, during, during the pandemic, it was like, I always, whenever I have a call center mm -hmm. experience, I always ask people where they're at and they're, they're in the uh, Czech Republic most mm -hmm. of the time when I spoke to them. Yeah. And, uh, it was just really great. The service. Mm. I'm just thinking about you yeah. know during the pandemic, you know, you could you cancel for free, and mm. uh, that was really cool. Um, and that's and part of when you see that. I don't know if that was a KLM center or an outsource center, but as long as you've got people who are focused on that and care about that. So with the airline stuff, that's what we did. That's what outsourcers do. That's what we do here. Is our only our only business is to really climb into your business and deliver like you, and probably right. better than you, because I haven't got to worry about all of your other core business. I'm not worried about your plane and whether there's an engineer or kerosene, I'm not worried about it. All I'm worried about is, is that customer experience on that phone. Right. So I will do my bit and make sure Elvis is really, really happy and you leave, that's great. And you know that Yeah, industry. and that's my bit's done. Yeah. And somebody else is dealing with the plane and the engineers and that's your core KLM, but the service doesn't have to be your core. I can do that. I can deliver that for right. you really well. Right, and then the thing with the demographics, I, I mean, if, if people aren't aware, um, everybody's aware of what's going on. Africa is the youngest mm. continent by no, far, yeah. and it's going to stay like that mm. for quite a while. And in the global north, we've got this post-pandemic uh, labor shortage. Mm. People don't want to come back to work. Yeah. I don't know where they went, but they, they're not no, there No, I'd anymore. love to not come back to work, but certainly <laughs> I need to so eat. And <laughs> the thing that, and this is speculative, we mm. still have to find out what's happening. Mm. But this idea that I have is the people who are not coming back to work have found ways to make money in, they've, they've found ways to, not all of them, but to, to kind of follow their passion, hmm. right? Follow, side hustle some, that earns yeah, you money. Yeah, 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 right. Do the And guess where that is? That's also online. Hmm. So it's a, a bunch of new clients coming this way hmm. for smaller tech support. So, for example, what I'm doing, I'm doing this with the editing. I'm going to hmm. need somebody to edit this hmm. for me. In Germany, that's expensive, right? Yeah. Um, down here, you got a price competitive edge and... and that's the... I and the skill. So not right. price competitive edge and I'm buying cheap and it's not really going to be, it's going to be cheap and dirty. Same skill, same talent, same, you know, same ability. And that's the difference. It's not, I think we've got to make sure we move away from this impact sourcing or, or even the cost benefit. Isn't, it's not philanthropic. It gives you the same service. What we deliver here is as good, I'm biased, if not better than we deliver in some of our other sites. 
you know, and the reason we grew was because of our performance. Like I said, that's the thing. So when you come here, it's not like you know you can sleep at night and feel like you've got a halo around your head. It's because it gives you the commercial benefit, procurement people happy, business happy, and it gives you the service benefit because it makes a big difference. And these guys are learning the skills and they're eager to learn more. Um, so they're not looking for that, you know, kind of right. How do I go and do something else? So it makes a it makes a big difference to them. Right. So tell me about that a little bit because you we have a lot of times we're talking about human capital and mm. you know skills shortages and and but what is this ecosystem like in the sense of your partners that you're working with? You're working with Harambe. You're mm -hmm. working with the Digital Skills Accelerator Africa with yep. GIZ, with uh, Education First is mm. in there, and there's a bunch of people making the landing softer for someone like you coming in here looking for talented people or, or what would I call quasi-talented people, like half, hmm. no, talented but quasi-skilled, like they need to get they just a need little direction. bit of time. They just yeah. need direction yeah. and opportunity. And one I always quote, and probably my lot are over it, there's an African proverb that said it takes a village to raise a child. And when you come here, it's about that. You know, you aren't going to come here and, and everything is on a plate and you just walk in and plug and play. It takes a bit of effort and it takes a bit of working around how you find the right things. Um, a good example is just my life. When I'm in South Africa, I can walk into a supermarket, or you can in Germany, you get everything. Everything's on every shelf. It's a massive supermarket, and you uh, go in and get it. It used to be. Oh, okay. After, since the pandemic. Oh, yeah, okay, right, right. okay, there's no toilet <laughs> but rolls. But other than that, uh, so. <laughs> but it's, it's, still, it's still great. Yeah, you, go, still into, great. you go into a supermarket and you do that. We've got 15 brands, not, yeah. not 100 anymore. So, so. I'm in, in Rwanda, so I've been here two years now. I can get all of that. I can absolutely find toilet rolls. I can get what I need, but I have to go here to get my toilet rolls from the toilet roll shop. I go there to get my meat from the butchers. I go, so it's all here, but I've got to make a bit more effort to go and do that. I can't just wheel my trolley in, scoop a load of stuff off the shelves and walk out again. So, and I think for me that, that when you're here, and that's, I think, why the outsource partnership works, because as a, as a captive or as a company, maybe I don't want to do that because I've got a million other things to do. Well, we take away all that. It's all a black box to you. I will deliver you a person that can do exactly what you want. And then we work with Harambi, Education First, DSAA, whoever it is, to say, right, what are the initiatives we can do that? Because the ultimate aim is to create employment. I'm not technical. I am no rocket scientist at all. But I like the ability to create opportunity, to create employment, and then deliver an operation that does what it says on the tin. That's the bit that kind of gets me out of bed. And that's what you can do here as long as you come in knowing you've just got to construct that. It's not going to be delivered to you on a plate. You're going to construct it, and you're going to work with partners to do that. And for me, that's more rewarding. And you, it's almost like diversity within, within an operation. It's diversity within that ecosystem. How do we work together? And not just, not just the Harambis or Education First of this world, but also the other people that come in to, to provide outsource services. How do I work with you? Right. What's it going to work? Because if we start to, you know, we saw it in some of the other big sites in India and the Philippines, you start to cannibalize the workforce and start to create a merry-go-round of people, then that's not going to help anyone. You know, there's enough talent, there's enough, um, unfortunately, unemployment out there, so let's work together to create the right talent for each area, not go, well, you come work here and create problems. So we, we want to work together as a, as a group of people within a country, because every time we don't find somebody employment, that's a failure for that person, but also for us, because we don't have 225 million people to go at. So from a Rwandan context, I want to work out what's going to get Elvis a job and the right job. So if that was with me and he's got a barrier with communication or doesn't know about Linux, how do I give him those skills? And then we'll employ him. Or actually, if he's not technical, but he's got a really good service ethic, then okay, how does he go and work for one of those guys that does more service-related stuff? And then maybe in years to come, his aspiration is to be technical. So we work with him to give him technical skills through Elevate or whatever it is. Right, right. So when I first walked into your office about a year ago here, and I, I didn't know what to expect, uh, because what I was telling you was mm. that I'm trying to bring more companies like yours here. Mm -hmm. I'm trying, well, not bring them here, but just show them yeah. and see whether or not this is for them. Mm -hmm. Right? Is this somewhere where you would like to go? Yeah. I wasn't sure how you'd react. You, you know, because uh, you know, if if we bring more companies here, it could kind of deplete the workforce mm -hmm. in, a, in a in a small. But you were so you been in the space for 17 years, and when I came in, you kind of uh, received me with open arms and said. Uh, Obviously, I regret that now, but yeah. it's kind of like, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and and you, and you you really genuinely said, "How can I help?" And you've been working at mm. helping other companies come in here, right? and I've seen this in this ecosystem. Mm. There's Deriv, there's yeah. Schnell Media from Germany, mm. there's CCI just setting up, yeah. there's VIPP towards the French market, mm. right? 
you've been you, you've been kind of helping other companies because you know that in the long run or in the medium term mm-hmm. run, growing a bigger cluster is going to bring more clients here, is going to bring more work yeah. here, and you're not going to have a bottleneck on the supply side of work, right? No. That's going to you just it, that's yeah. going to keep coming. Yeah, agreed. And I and I think that it is that and again from a South African context, it's that Ubuntu sense of. I am because you are. If we all work together and realize that's the end game, then we can all work together. There's plenty of work out there. There's plenty of people here with the skills. So we've just got to make sure that we work together to make it work. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's, again, the, the strength of being able to work um, in someone like Rwanda to do that. And we did it to a certain degree in South Africa through Bupesa and through working together. It, everyone's going to have their their secret sauce and their delivery things. Absolutely go away and do that. But that's the bit that you do and you do in, you know, you go be you. But actually as a, as a team of people to make it work, it's far better if we all work together to do that um, and solve those problems before they happen rather than saying, oh, no, you can't come here because that might cause me an issue. Right. Um, so at some point you still might, well, tech is maybe very specific, but you still might at some point compete for a contract yeah. with, a, with a competitor. But that doesn't mean you can't, Help each other. That's a, that's the clustering effect, right? Yeah, Being close right. together. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so if a BPO, if a global business services company comes into Rwanda to see the place, uh, of course, first would be Rwanda Development Board, mm. kind of check them out, see yeah. see what they give you. But uh, your door is open. Yeah, Gary, yeah. Gary Bennett, we've had. Tech yeah, yeah, we've had we've had a, a couple of guys coming through here. So CCI already here. Come see it. See what the deal is. Um, some of the other global providers come look at it, and not everyone's going to say yes. Some of it is just understanding it, um, and 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 me as well, selfishly understanding what you want to do. How do you want to work? Right. So it is about it's about reciprocal, you know, kind of talking and understanding, and, and genuinely that like working together. Because um, if you don't, in my opinion, if you don't do it with an open arms like that, it could happen anyway. And then you've just put yourself in a bad situation. If I've right. created that relationship with you already, whether or not it goes somewhere or whether or not we have conflict in the future, we've created at least a common ground to work on. Yeah. And then you work your own business around that. So, yeah. Right, right, great. It's fascinating times to live in. Mm. I just think it's really interesting. It is. Thanks for doing this, Gary. Pleasure. It's good great. to see you. Thank you very much. Thanks.